Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. This is not so much about the worth of advertising as such. It's about the deal between advertising and society, and specifically whether it's the right time to remake that deal. This debate has been going on for several hundred years, um, and there's been thoughtful people expressing views on it on both sides. It was Franz Kafka, um, he of Joseph K and the giant cockroach, um, who said, I don't read advertisements. I'd spend all my time wanting things. And actually, that's not, that's not a bad way of looking at it, because no one forces you to read advertising, no one forces you to look at advertising. But if you want things, it's quite a good place to start. Advertising in this market is predominantly not a kind of blind um, or insensitive thing. It is necessarily, for commercial and societal reasons, pretty sensitive to the people around it and the society around it. Looking at an ad now, if you see a television commercial, it's absolutely certain that that will have been tested and researched in some way before it was even made. The script will have been sent to a regulator to be checked for truthfulness, for taste and decency, before the film is produced. When the film is produced, it'll be tracked to see how it's affecting the audience and the stakeholders that that organization, that company, that charity, that government uh, cares about. Because the fact is that advertising only works, only exists at all, because companies, charities, organizations, governments believe that it's useful for people to have their message. And it only continues to thrive because enough of those people believe that the message and the dialogue that it engenders is worth having. This is about now dialogue, and all companies and organizations are intensely sensitive to that because their reputation is, by and large, the most valuable thing on their balance sheet, and they don't want to damage that by the way that they advertise. And the industry is very aware of that. It's why we do um, maintain a very close dialogue with government, and we maintain a close dialogue with what is being said about advertising in society. And it's, you know, it's vitally important for all sorts of reasons that advertising stays within the parameters and, and, and sort of broad uh, mores of public taste. The second thing is about the media. Advertising in this country, display advertising, amounts to something like five billion pounds. And almost all of that ends up going not to the people who produce advertising, but to the people who, who run media. And the wealth and richness and diversity of the media sector in, in the UK, which, you know, Leveson notwithstanding, is pretty much the envy of the world, is almost exclusively to do with the money that's funded through or subsidised through advertising. So if we didn't have advertising, we'd only have the BBC and Sky as TV channels. If we didn't have advertising, The Guardian or The Times, well, they, to be honest, they probably wouldn't exist because they'd cost five or six pounds to buy and not enough people would buy them. Now, that's a part of the deal. That content and that news is part of what we get through advertising. And my third point is this thing about what's the, what are we talking about when we talk about advertising? To vilify advertising for promoting the wrong values, for extrinsic values rather than intrinsic values, or encouraging overconsumption, I think is ultimately an example of a category mistake. It's like saying, we don't like the carbon emissions that, that cars produce. OK, where do carbon emissions come from? Exhaust pipes. What we'll do is we'll ban exhaust pipes. That will take the problem away. Well, of course it won't, because that might be the output mechanism, but there's a whole engine and machine behind it. And advertising, like it or not, is a part of the regulated capital market economy in which we live. And you can think you can like that or you can not like it, but you can't really separate advertising out from it. It may well be that our economic system is, as Churchill said about democracy, the worst of all possible systems except for all the other ones that we know about. So, in sum, I believe that 
Advertising does remake its deal. It does it on a constant basis. It does it in order to survive. And I do believe that it is part of a system that has actually done a considerable amount of good. And I do believe we should value it for its incidental benefits, things like the media we have. Should we think of advertising as evil, as we kind of hint in our report? No, actually, despite the provocative name, as, uh, as Avner Offner of Oxford University said, we, we shouldn't. But what, we, what I would propose is that advertising is out of control in our society today, and the resultant impacts on social and cultural values are doing our society and our economy a great disservice. That advertising has an access all areas pass in our lives, a pass of which the industry is taking full advantage. And the big game in town is to push advertising into ever more spaces, from naming football stadia to product placement in television, to schools, building exteriors and beyond. There are media companies today who will carve your brands into trees and claim they're environmentally friendly for doing so. As Linda Kaplan-Thaler, CEO of the Kaplan-Thaler Group in the US says, ubiquity is the new exclusivity. And just sit with those words for a moment. Ubiquity is the new exclusivity. But something's changing now. We're starting to realize that we can't count economic contributions with one eye closed. We're starting to understand that measuring the success of a nation by GDP is like measuring the success of a company by turnover alone. We're on the brink of developing true cost-benefit or profit and loss analyses of nations and of major industries. And when that happens, the advertising industry needs to be very careful. Why is this? Well, you'll have to read our report for a full answer. But the hypothesis we pose is rooted in the study of cultural values, now an established field after 25 years of consistent findings. This field of social psychology poses a model of human behavior which says that we are by nature at least as cooperative as we are competitive, at least as selfless as narrowly self-interested, and at least as driven by the desire for fulfillment and purpose as by the desire for status and success relative to our peers. In shorthand, it poses that we are by nature at least as intrinsically, on our own terms, as extrinsically relative to others motivated in our lives. Note the phrase by nature. Because when you introduce advertising into the mix, especially in its current ubiquity, the scales tip. Unsurprisingly, exposure to advertising is related to a prevalence of extrinsic motivation. A wide range of studies, which we review in more detail in the report, provide statistical evidence that higher levels of advertising lead to people working longer hours, saving less, and borrowing and buying more. Now, the impact of that is terrifying purely on economic grounds, with personal debt in the UK already over one and a half trillion pounds, which is nearly double the current national debt. And it's predicted to rise by 50% by 2015. If advertising is adding to that debt burden, then it's doing a great disservice to our economy. But the wider impacts are actually even more concerning. When it ext extrinsic motivations dominate, our likelihood to care about the problems of others diminishes significantly, whether those others are people, animals, or the world as a whole. As a result, where extrinsic motivations are prevalent, social equity is less and negative enviral impact is, environmental impact is greater. The question we have to ask now is this. For all the benefits, and Mark talked about some of these, that advertising brings, what are the costs? Because those are part of the deal too. And what are the costs in the undermining of informal support networks, of ecosystem services, and of personal, mental, and physical well-being? Is advertising in its present form and at its present level of ubiquity contributing to economic growth or to what former World Bank economist Herman Daly calls uneconomic growth, where the marginal costs of an increase in GDP exceed the marginal benefits? The evidence strongly suggests the latter. The single most important thing we can do is to stop advertising creep into ever more parts of our lives. As I've been careful to say, it's not necessarily advertising as such that's the problem, but the current state of sheer ubiquity certainly is. As we conclude in our report, advertising is neither evil nor useless, but it is out of control. We must create space for our intrinsic motivations to be expressed and validated. We need to nurture and celebrate what's great about culture, not, stri not strive to strengthen the already dominant role of the consumer. And for that to happen, advertising has to give us at least a little bit of room to breathe. Once we've found a way to halt the spread, we then need to go deep into the cost-benefit analysis and start to remove advertising from the places it should not be by striving to remove advertising from childhood. We know children cannot form the implicit social contracts that we adults do when we open a magazine and no advertising has subsidised its cover price. We know from recent work by UNICEF that materialism is a major factor causing UK childhood wellbeing to be the lowest in any OECD nation. A ban on advertising to children, I admit, could never be complete, but it would give us the chance to start our lives as something other than consumers, and it would set a very important tone. 
As a new society emerges, the advertising industry would do well to withdraw itself from the arena of childhood and to start understanding where else its borders should retract. It needs to embrace research into the social and economic costs it incurs, not just trying to justify the benefits. If it does not, it will soon come to be seen as evil, whether it deserves it or not. Doing some of the, the research around uh, kind of marketing uh, to children, there's been a longer debate going on in some other countries, uh, both continental Europe and the States as well. You know, I came across some pretty crass and crap examples uh, of marketing that was out there. And no doubt there are people who want that. It's a kind of, you know, a free market. But there are issues that raise questions about responsibility. This was another one aimed at um, teenage girls uh, that, you know, we, we came across, which is uh, Playboy uh, pillowcases. Uh, and these kinds of things, I think, probably do raise questions of, well, what is acceptable or what is not? Whose values should decide in relation to something like that. Now, I think the good news is that actually the advertising industry has started to engage with these issues and with, the, with these debates. And the change from three to five years ago is absolutely palpable. Now, there's been a lot of work done on the sexualization of children and, and very welcome work, quite careful work, I think. It's a difficult area because the sexualization of childhood, which it, on many of the statistics uh, is, is undoubtable over, kind of, over time, is really the spillover of a sexualized adulthood. You know, actually kids see far more explicit or unacceptable, whether it's in advertising or, or more widely, um, out there that's aimed at adults, that spills over to children. So if we, you know, live unsustainable lifestyles, rack up climate change, uh, and celebrate sex and gender divisions, then it's no surprise that the, the kids pick up the same messages. And there's risks in loading onto children, you know, what are essentially things that we ought to be taking responsibility for. One of the things that shocked me looking at what was there in terms of the £100 billion uh, worth of the, of the market for children's products uh, and services, huge market, growth market as well, was the, the gender divisions. In many ways, I think advertising does reflect the world around us. And responsibility is not halved. Parents should take responsibility, but so should advertisers and so should government, finding the right space in this. But the gender side of it was just staggering because it was as if the women's movement had never existed. Uh, you see that on the adverts with the role portrayals. You see it more widely in films and the like. It's a fantastic organisation in the States called Seeing Jane, which is run by fathers in favour of better gender models uh, in the world of entertainments uh, and marketing as well. And they did research that showed, uh, actually in family movies, uh, women are twice as likely to hold a professional job, you may have a professional job, twice as likely to hold a professional job or to be running their own business in real life as they are on screen. And these are the kinds of images uh, that are pushed kind of out and around. The other area of concern was uh, an encouragement of materialism. If you put your value in things rather than yourself, that is not good uh, ultimately for your self-esteem uh, or for your well-being. In my view, you, there are limits to the extent which you can ban. And banning advertising is a bit silly if you're not going to ban marketing, because marketing is the product design and putting it out there in the first place. Uh, I think public service content. You know, the BBC, the Rethian agenda was developed when we said that the media ought not to be purely commercialised, that there is a public benefit that should be recognised in public service broadcasting. And I think we need a new Rethian agenda uh, for the internet age and elsewhere. I think that we ought to be seeing a benefit in developing particularly children's programming uh, that is of value and that is free from some of the commercialised cowboy monetization that goes on kind of online uh, to support that uh, kind of more widely. But I think the last thing that I would say is that advertising and marketing has a huge power as well to do good. Um, I, in my uh, previous role at the National Consumer Council, helped to start a programme of work for the NHS in England uh, using what was called social marketing. And the idea of social marketing is about bringing the, the powerful toolkit of marketing to bear to support 
public health. Along the idea, as one of the practitioners puts it, if marketing got us into this mess, then maybe marketing can get us out. In Australia, they used a, a social marketing approach from the 1970s. They did the segmentation, they did the insight work, and they identified that the best groups to go after was young people to persuade them not to smoke in the first place. And they went after them in a very aggressive way, using advertising, marketing, uh, and all. Australia does not have a universal smoking cessation service, which we do. Australia does not have a universal smoking ban, as we do. But if you compare the smoking rates, which were similar in the 1970s, what you'll find is that for the UK or England, on current trends to get down to no smoking and no adult smoking, or 5%, adult smoking will take us through to something like 2060, 2065. Australia, because of the marketing work they've done on that issue since the 1970s, is likely to be there by 2020 or 2025. So there is a space for marketing and advertising, but it can only be and should be a responsible one. I think that the extent to which we're in a new situation has, as usual, been uh, greatly overstated. Uh, 1957 is when Vance Picard, Packard published Hidden Persuaders, and 30, 40 years ago, the sort of anti-advertising uh, culture and, and fears about advertising were probably greater than, than they are today. The two things which are, I think, new, uh, one of them is that uh, I think you know, the growth of digital media has had a number of effects, uh, most of them rather good uh, in terms of uh, empowering consumers uh, both to switch away from uh, advertising they don't like and also uh, to say rude things about products and services they don't like to each other. Uh, so that's sort of a good thing. I don't think that changes the fundamentals. What has happened is in the last three years, for extremely good reasons, uh, public trust in institutions, including companies and brands, has gone down. Now, if we look at uh, criticisms of advertising, I think there are four different angles which should probably be distinguished more often from each other. There's a relatively minor one which is to do with advertising being intrusive or annoying. Uh, most consumers uh, would say that you know, the benefits of uh, having advertising paying for a lot of our media outweigh that intrusiveness, particularly because uh, consumers can pretty easily switch away from quite a lot of advertising, although not all. The second, uh, which I think some of the anti-advertising people are not that explicit about, but the linkage with the impact of economic activity on the environment, primarily we have to be quite clear that yes, advertising does help to drive economic growth, primarily not in the way many people think, because uh, including some of the fans of advertising by persuading people to consume more but as an inherent part of a market economy. You basically have a choice between two generic systems. One is a planned economy, and the other is a market economy. And planned economies have shown themselves extraordinarily bad at innovating. So uh, if we're saying we don't like growth, then let's say we don't like growth. I think there's a third closely related thing, which is not so much an economic argument per se, um, because economics tends to assume that demand is kind of exogenous. Um, it's, it's more the idea that uh, the bad kind of consumerism uh, is about materialism and selfishness and so on, and um, that it leads to what people like John regard as, quote, unnecessary needs and wants. I personally would be a little bit... Uh, skeptical about the idea that greed and selfishness and so on, um, you know, was sort of created by advertising. I would be a little bit more concerned about the fact that modern capitalism um, is uh, increasing the gaps between the haves and the have-nots, and it's quite likely that advertising is increasing the unhappiness of the have-nots. We, again, have quite a few knowledge gaps, but we actually know much more than is reflected in what I think has been quite a low quality debate uh, because of the obsession with, with advertising when Walkers does quite significantly reduce the fat content of its crisps. All it gets from the NGOs is a very large rhubarb saying crisps, even with lower fat, are still bad for you. And it seems to me that's not a constructive response. 
okay, that the, the, we should be looking to reduce the fat content of products and encouraging people to consume those reduced fat products. Um, the really big issue for the long term is to understand and influence the way that food preferences develop in the first five years. Mexican babies don't like chili con carne. Mexican 10-year-olds will sort of wither on the vine if they can't have their chili con carne. So something has happened, and it isn't about genes between 0 and 10. And the same happens in different types of household in the UK. And as far as I can see, essentially none of the massive debate has actually focused on that. So I think where does that leave us? Uh, it's let's not sort of, you know, I'm very glad that, that um, John made it clear at the beginning of his talk he is not saying advertising is evil because you then really have to come up with what's your counterfactual. Then we get on to what to me is a much more grown-up discussion, which is what kind of capitalism. Is it Swedish capitalism? Is it American capitalism? And so on. That seems to me to be a very good debate. And then we have the, the specific issues, case by case, in which I have to say the one I've most been involved with, which is the obesity one, I think the quality of that debate has been abysmal for the last 15 years. And... Uh, I think that uh, we would be 10 years further along if there'd been far less obsession with advertising in that and much more of a consumer-centric uh, analysis of, you know, what are the things which drive obesity and what are the various levers we can pull to influence those.